welcome to the V3C again. Um, so the show today uh, on the agenda, we've got uh, three things that we want to talk about. Um, we want to talk about the new Data Quality Explorer, uh, how it's going to present on that. Um, this is an extension to the spreadsheet that we showed you a couple of meetings ago. Um, Chris wants to update you on the work he's been doing with the activity list. Um, and then we're going to have a kind of discussion about prioritising future uh, focus for this group uh, and then a bit of time for AOB at the end. Um, so I think with that, I'll hand over to Howard to talk about Data Quality Explorer. Howard. Excellent. Um, yeah, so we, we've been through this process over the last um, six months, probably probably even a little bit more. Um, we had Office of National Statistics in to talk about uh, some of the approaches they recommend in terms of improving data quality. And we followed that process or a version of that process, which is to focus on the use cases um, you know, focus on the purpose that the data was collected um, and work out what would look good in that sense, and then to devise some metrics, report on those regularly, and hopefully drive some improvements. So we're getting to that reporting on those regularly stage now. Um, so we've got a new tool that um, we're, we're, we're about to test, I think, with uh, we, probably over the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll be looking for some volunteers to to run through the tool with Chris uh, after I've run through the tool with Chris um, and equipped him for the job. Um, and he can you know talk through some of the the data quality issues uh, and you can look at the data in real time and it's quite it's quite help, in, intuitive that way. Hopefully that's the idea. Um, so we'll focus initially on the discovery and booking use cases. These are the metrics that we've seen uh, we've developed over the last few months. So we have been showing them in a spreadsheet over the last few calls. Um, this is present them in a, a new way and hopefully a way that allows you to explore the data and identify areas that can be improved. So we're going to be looking for feedback and the proposal is to replace the existing visualizer tool, which is visualizer.openactive.io. So next slide, please, Andrew. Uh, and there's an example of the, the Open Active Data Visualizer, which is a tool we inherited from Open Referral. Um, is as a means of a quick and dirty means of visualizing the data uh, and exploring the data that's available via a data feed. So we've we've taken that kind of skeleton and and added some of the measures that we've been looking at. So here's a an example um, for one of the one of the leisure centers, Castle Point, um, and it just shows the metrics that we've been talking about. So. Um, so basically, what is it? It's the, does the record have a name, a valid name, a valid description, and an activity which matches to the activity list? Um, so that's that first measure there, that 100%. Does the, does the record have either a postcode or geospatial coordinates so it can be displayed in Activity Finder and used for geospatial search? Does it have a valid start date, a start in date in the future for you know for an activity that can be booked? Um, and then this measure of, we've got a proxy measure of um, whether there's a link that takes you right through to the session, to book onto the session or the or the slot or wherever it might be. Um, so we've got a, a bit of a proxy measure there because that's, you know, there's a lot of variation in how those URLs might be calculated. So we're just counting, summarizing a count of unique URLs in the data. Um, And yeah, so we've got some totals, so some counts. What the data does, it looks, if there are two related feeds, let's say you've got a session series and a scheduled session feed, then it looks at it looks at both of those and tries to bring that information together as, as you would do in an activity finder. Um, and so it summarizes that, that data there. So the, the data quality measures are based on that combined data feed where it's possible to combine them. Um, do you want to jump on? There's a, there's another couple of examples, I think. Uh, so that's one of the bigger feeds, one of the every everyone active feeds. Um, and again, that the URL is uh, the, the one where you know that provides that seamless link from an activity finder right through to booking. And that's still one of the ones that uh, we we kind of need to work on as an initiative. 
Um, that's uh, that's just a quick update on that. That's what we're working on at the moment. We just deployed a, a fix into the development environment they're evaluating. Nick, I'll provide you with an update a little later today, tomorrow. Uh, and if that was all fits the bill, Nick, we'll be looking to aim to put that into their live environment probably next week. Superb. That's, I mean, that's that's spot on. Uh, is it roll on, Andrew? See if there's, I think, is there another one? Uh, no, blank page. That was where I was going to do a little quick demo. So um, I think I can do that for us now. I'm going to try and um, share the screen if that's okay. That's fine. I've made you a co-host, so you should be able to do that. Okay. Share screen. And we'll go with this one. Okay, so I think you can see that now. Um, like the, the visualizer, there's a drop down which has got a list of um, feeds, and it's almost complete. I've taken out a couple at the moment while we just work work on some of the presentation. The numbers weren't coming through right. So there's no course instances in there at the moment, but things like um, session series, schedule sessions, and then on the other side, the facility use and slots, um, those come through quite quickly. So this is one, oops, oh, that's that little quirk where the uh, chart appears twice. Ignore that, that'll be fixed. Um, so that that's read, um, you know, three pages and six pages from the other feed. Uh, the, the results are cached, so it's quite quick. Um, particularly if you go back to it. So um, let me find one that I haven't run and see how long that takes. Uh, live data. Oh, there we go. That was uh, not too bad. So that was uh, just an example. It, you know, it's quite a quick process. Um, and then, yeah, the message is right there. So. 17.3% with an act with a matching activity ID, 100% have got name and 100% have got description. And, you know, and those are kind of required fields anyway. So that's what we should expect to see. Um, it's a little small, and I'll be working on how to make that text larger, but we've got a summary of the top five activity types there. Um, and of course, we still bring in some of the capabilities from the visualizer tool. So you can look at the raw JSON data for, for a record, um, you know, and drill into any kind of issues you might find there. And you can send that JSON also to the validator, which has opened in another screen so you can't see it, which is not very helpful. Um, but you know, that's a one one click takes you through takes that JSON and puts it into the validator and gives you some more exact um, links and hints on how to, to get the data compliant and improve the quality. So I'll stop there. I think um, that was all I wanted to, to show you, but um, it, you know, it feels like we're, we, we get to a place where those measures we've been talking about, you know, there's a, there's a tool there that could kind of make them quite useful and handy and hopefully help to, to raise the data quality of, in the initiative from the perspective of, you know, right through to those activity finders and the people trying to um, find and book an activity. I'll stop there. Excellent. Thanks, Howard. Um, that's really useful. Uh, I just wonder if anyone has any questions or observations on that. Yeah, Andrew, where do where do we find that tool? It may sound like a silly question. I did look on the Open Active uh, website under the tools and resources. I couldn't see it though. Right, sorry, Stephen. I, I, I that was my my. I should have said. Um, so the plan is we've got a prototype up and running now, and I'd like to just test that with a couple of um, of keen volunteers. Um, and you know, so if if you want to take a look. I'll um, I'll provide the details with Chris, um, and Chris can kind of share those with people who are, who are interested. So, can we take you as a first volunteer, um, Stephen? And yeah, just... that's that's fine. That works out well for us because, um, but some of you will know that we only made half of our uh, um, centers open data 
enabled uh, last year, then we took a pause, but we just restarted doing the rest of it. And it'll be a trickle feed over the next couple of weeks or so as we get the rest of the state enabled. So this will be a good tool for us to check the quality of the data of those we're actually enabling. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, so it's, it's just a prototype at the moment, um, just while we iron out any, any bugs. So any feedback from your from your explanations will be uh, really be useful. Thing I will say, with the bigger feeds like, like betters, um, that initial load does take does take uh, you know might take five eight minutes something like that while it um, while it brings all the data in. So um, for those bigger feeds, it's not quite as instant. Um, How it just on the back of that, is it possible you can pass me that link as well, and I can pass it on to Debbie as well because you'll be yeah, just looking at some of the data. Absolutely, process. that's brilliant. And um, thank you. The idea is once we find out any kinks, we will replace the existing visualizer tool with, with this one. I think that's the right proposal anyway. So I, I did want to ask the group if they had any objections to that. Um, if you go back a couple of slides, um, Andrew, just to show the visualizer again, it, um, you know, we're basically just adding functionality. This visualizer does have those filters and the intention is to return to restore some of that function functionality, so you can um, you can hone in on particular locations was the thing that um, or organisations was the one that you know sites was the one that Debbie mentioned in the past. So I'll be looking to to add that back in. Um, so my, that's my proposal that we replace that that tool with this new one, which basically is the same thing with the dashboard. Um, it, it, so if any thoughts on that or any concerns around that. That would be good to know. And, and I guess people aren't concerned about losing those filters if they know that they're coming back at some point in the future either. Uh, what I would say is I don't think this represents all users of the visualizer. I know EMD, for example, um, do use those filters, or at least did. I'm, I'm not sure the current the folks there do. Um, so it might be worth thinking about maybe before replacing it, just putting the filters back again as a as a, as a last thing, to, last step. Um, if it sounds like it's it's improved upon what was there, and if that's the case, I'm, I'm sure there'd be no issue with um, with replacing what was there. It's the same but better. That's great. Thanks. Nick. Not all these filters are working um, right now either. So that's uh, you know. So we'll be looking to to fix those, make them more relevant to the feeds. Uh, and the challenges that data publishers, like like Debbie mentioned, it's the site kind of level quality that we're really interested in. Um, and so we'll try and we'll try and bring that functionality back over the next month. I, I think the the only other thing I would add is that we are aware that exposing data quality can be a little bit controversial. Um, so, so we are trying to kind of manage the release of this. I, I, th I think you know where we've got engaged people who are part of the community who are coming to calls regularly. That's fairly easy to do. Um, I, I, I think we 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 will, we will do some wider comms though because not everyone is as engaged as you guys. Um, so we we need to make sure that we're telling everyone about this and what it means and what it shows and explaining our logic. Um, and, and Chris, as Howard has said, will be providing support to publishers as well to help them understand what the data means and help them to understand how to improve. So yeah, okay. If there aren't any more questions on that. I propose we move on to talk about um, to talk about the activity list. Chris. Thank you, Andrew. Um, hi, everyone. Hope you're all well. I know it's been a, <clears throat> think a while since I've been on one of these calls just due to illness and annual leave. So good to see everyone again. Um, so it's been, a, I think, a while since we spoke about the activity list. So I thought I'd just go through a recap just first of all. Um, <clears throat> so Obviously, we had a, a process in place for a long time of where there was a committee, um, but there was also, you know, a long drawn out process for anyone who wanted to add a submission um, or suggest adding a submission to the activity list. Um, you know, case of once a suggestion was made, um, it was too many steps, you know, to actually get the activity added. The, the committee wasn't convening on a regular basis as it should have been. Um, that then created a huge backlog excuse me, um, of activities. So I took a sort of a, a deep dive analysis of the whole process of the activity list, looking at the quality of it, looking at the whole process, and then came up with some ideas of a best way forward. 
um, and then sitting down with colleagues, the decision was made to, you know, have this exceptions process in place where it should only then take, you know, a matter of minutes to decide whether an activity was worth adding to a list or if it needed to, you know, come along to this committee rather than potentially waiting two to three months before something could actually be approved. And then, you know, another month or two before it actually gets added to uh, to the list. Um, so, but then to sort of help with that process as well, um, I updated the web form uh, from the website where the submissions were made just to get as much information as possible because the previous web form, I think only asked four questions, uh, nothing was mandatory. You could literally just type in whatever you wanted. Um, and you know, so if I needed any further information or if anyone needed further information, you wouldn't be able to really get it if nobody put their contact details on there or the company that they're um, submitting from. So we've, you know, so we've got this new exceptions process in place. Now we've got a new web form. The website has been updated as well um, to include this new web form. Um, so everything's now, you know, obviously flowing as better as can be. So moving on to that now, we are talking about the backlog. As I said, there was a backlog of activities which has now been cleared. So everything's now cleared and I've added um, 48 new activities um, to the list. Now, one of the um, things about this activity list was about inclusivity. It was making sure that <clears throat> we're including both physically active, but also activities that will help with um, health and well-being and mental well-being. Um, so in keeping with those themes, you know, across those 48 new activities added, We've got things like chair yoga, canoe slalom, uh, para netball, activity holiday camps, camping, acting, singing, crash, and as I said, you know, there's many, many more. Um, and now the number of activities on the list now currently stands at 741. So we've got quite a lot uh, that are on there now. Um, on the next slide, don't go to it yet just yet, Andrew, but on the next slide for when everyone wants to, you know, look at it, um, is the list of the 48 that I've added um, to the list. So you can see in a bit more detail what ones have actually gone on there. Um, and then just some next steps. So, as I said, the backlog is now cleared. Uh, the new web form's um, up. Um, nothing's been submitted so far on the new web form just yet. So um, waiting for, you know, new submissions to come through on that. So what I'm currently working on now is re, you know improving the data quality issues but making sure that what these issues are that they're not going to have an impact on the integrity of the list so you know for example i'm not going to be going about renaming um, potential activities or deleting anything then it's going to like start breaking systems it's not a case of that <clears throat> um, but what i'm starting with is looking at the ones that don't have a definition so I wanted to make sure that we, you know, the, I suppose we, if we want to look at it from a data quality dimensions perspective, I'm looking at the completeness, is everything there needed? So I'm looking at that definition now. Um, so when I started that, there were 399 activities that didn't have um, a definition. Um, and I've been working, you know, sort of flat out, um, just trying to add the definition, but also a, a good definition, not just a couple of words that you think, oh, that'll do. Um, but that's now, I've got that down to 189 now. So a good couple of hundred I've, I've managed to sort of add a definition to. Um, hopefully by the next call in a couple of weeks, I'll have cleared all them. So there'll be, you know, nothing or no activities rather, sorry, that will be missing the definition. Um, but then once that task is then completed, then I'll sort of want to look a bit more into the other data quality dimensions. Um, to see what potential issues there are, say around validity or consistency um, for, or accuracy for argument's sake. Um, and then I'll put a findings pack together and then report back to the group once I've got something um, and then decide then on what the next steps should be bearing, you know, obviously going back to that previous point of being careful that the integrity of the list isn't compromised in, in any way at all. Um, and then just linking back to um, what Howard mentioned about the framework there, you know, that one of the fields that we're measuring is around the activity list ID matches. So that's going to be something that I'll be working on as well as making sure those figures start getting improved as well. Um, so I said that's a, just a brief run through of what's been happening since uh, the last call with the activity list. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Does anyone have any questions for Chris on this? I think you might Sorry, I was muted. Is me? What, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, sorry, Chris. It's Andy from Gladstone. Just a quick thing on the last call. Um, we talked about 
communication of any changes being applied so that likes of ourselves, we potentially they can let our clients know and feed it down so that they're aware of this change has been applied. So they then can go to their data manager, an example, and modify as they needed to, because it'll be picked up straight away. Um, so I'm not sure I've seen anything, but then I might not be in the loop, but is, was anything in place or can there be anything in place to let us know rather than this relying on this call, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, apologies. I think that's a call that I've missed, Andy. So I'm not too sure what was discussed around that or if any solution or resolution was um, um, discussed. I... Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, let me clarify, Chris. We so yeah, we did talk about uh, Debbie highlighted the importance of you know knowing about changes to the list in case it has knock-on effects in the, you know in their systems. They can they would be able to take advantage of new activities or whatever, um, and. My thinking was that communicating the any changes here at this group would be sufficient, um, Andy. So maybe my I got the wrong end of the stick there. If there's a preferred route, please let us know. But um, the next slide kind of contains the additions, and those would be held. You know, they're, they're kind of, we save these slides at the end of every session. Um, but if there's a better a better um, way to communicate that, then then please let me know. I mean, it's a work in progress, uh, Howard, to be fair. I mean, the, the thing with it is that if this hasn't been applied yet, then this is a perfect forum. But if this has been applied and we weren't made aware, yeah, we're, hon we're conscious that hopefully the integrity of the data is not going to upset anything in the data feeds and anything else at this moment on the data integrity. Okay. I think it's just that it's, that it's, it's probably just dotting the I's, crossing the T's and getting the timelines okay. aligned. So, so our aim is not to break anything with this, as Chris said. So, so hopefully, but, the, but we work in but we work in software. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, the changes we make don't don't break anything. Um, I, 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 there, there is a point, isn't there, about knowing when things have been added to the list. So, if you have a copy of the list rather than using the the the, the reference data, you can you can update your your local copy. Um, I, I think in terms of the comms around this, I, I'm really keen that we write something for the Open Active blog about how we've tackled the activity list and how we've improved the process and how we're, we're making it better and actually to, to promote the list a bit more and talk about what it is because I think it potentially has value beyond open active um I, I think in terms of changes I, I think we should be communicating those via slack it wouldn't be a big step in our process to post something on slack when we add a new entry or, or change an entry and we could probably even look at a way of automating that uh, although that, that would need a little bit of thought um yeah, yeah, I feel like something that might help people is if uh, changes are scheduled. So once we know what the changes are going to be, then we can schedule those changes for a, um, a time in the future, just so that people have time to prepare in case it can cause any issues. So changes alongside what, like additions, just as simple as that to begin with. I mean, because that, that's all I'm looking to do at the moment is just, you know, the, the additions, which is, you know, apologies, I said, I've already done these, these have already been added. Um, mm -hmm. But they're on there now but you know with the definitions that i'm working on at the moment i mean should would everyone like a list of like okay here are the next lump of activities that i'm going to add a definition to be prepared or i, I don't know so as i said it's, it's just i'm not working on any sort of amending names or deleting because you know i've come across quite a few duplicates but i'm not going to think about removing anything because that's that i know could obviously um interrupt you know someone's system or you know cause you know the integrity to the list because someone may be using that tag instead of using another one for i mean for argument's sake i've seen on their crossfits on their twice one with an uppercase c one with, one with a lowercase c i don't want to take one off because someone may be using the lowercase someone's using the uppercase that's just as an example i'm not doing that it's just the additions but like i said more than happy to you know communicate like andrew said via slack or to this group however to say right here's the next list that you know number of activities i will be adding a definition to by this time I, I, so i don't have uh, any thoughts on that i think that's a good move going forward so there's an awareness of what's been approached and what's been looked at there's another time but equally as well what it may also do is spark maybe a discussion with regards oh that's funny what about have we thought about this one and then more and also then promote the uh, the, the exceptions process as well so yeah it just brings it to the foresight of the mind rather than you know uh retrospective no, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I think it was just 
probably a bit overzealous and a bit keen to like you know think like because we've had this you, you were know, clearing a backlog over. weren't you Chris I think that the, uh, yeah. you know and were, we were keen to get that over and done with so but I think you know we can refine the process we'll use slack we'll give notification in advance so as, as Nathan says you know you've got time to kind of think it through um before so if we try and give uh I don't know should we say two weeks notice slack uh before before the changes go live we just build that into our process and we'll give that a go and see see how we go on yeah that seems like a reasonable compromise yeah okay I mean I can I tie say in, another, well, another... sorry I was just gonna sorry, I was just gonna quickly say I can tie it in like say with this group I can say you know on a on a Wednesday afternoon after this call I could say right here's the the list of activities that are going to have a definition added by the time we get to the next call if there's any you know anything money wants to raise <laughs> then they can raise it but there's nothing then I add after that potentially but yeah, that was... Nick, you were going to come in. Yeah, sorry, yeah so... Nathan, sorry. So... Sorry, oh, go. do you want... Sorry, go for it, Nick. If you... No, no, I don't have anything else to add. Oh, sorry, it was Nick. Oh, right, okay, so apologies. Someone, sorry. Apologies. It's <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, the two two things I had the uh, thoughts were, uh, yeah, having us uh, maybe even a separate Slack channel or, or you know putting on W3C notification Slack channel might be good. A separate one is good in some ways because you can then discuss it in that space. But there might be an advantage to having that clearly, you know, separate channel. That's that's an activity that's happening. Everyone's aware of it. It could be in that channel like the other main ones, which everyone's added to. Um, Sounds like a great idea to me. The other thing that crossed my mind is we currently don't really have a release process around the list, um, which we do on other projects. And if you use a release process on GitHub, you do get for free, if you like, a little release note that comes with exactly what's changed. And you can update that release note, et cetera, et cetera. And the advantage of that over putting it anywhere else is that we've then got a change log. And I think this is something I've mentioned previously. Um, we've talked about having a change log on this a few times, and, I, and there has been attempts at creating a change log in various places. Um, now, it's, it's become clear to me just through listening to this that I think probably GitHub is and releases is the right place to put that change log for a few reasons. One, it's where we put other change logs. Um, two, it's probably easier to maintain because it's easy to for Chris to log in and edit the things as they go. You know, you don't need to have access to code or anything to do that. Um, and um, and three, the other attempts we've had to do this in the past have involved, for example, there's a change log on the current activity list editor, which is an HTML page that someone needs to go into and edit and commit an update, and it's the same repo. So, and that's in the editor repo. So it doesn't really feel like the right place to put that. So, um, probably cleaner to keep it um, keep it separate. And my suggestion there would be that whenever the editor someone updates the editor and presses the button it currently automatically updates the list but maybe instead of doing that it should just create a pull request um that then can be everyone can see that's happening and then when that gets merged a release is created and that release has got the exact what's happened history there so you're basically using all the correct processes and then if anyone if there's a problem which is really what this is about right something's gone wrong someone can and it's easy to go back and go right where did that happen why did that happen you know you, what was the what was the point where it broke um which i think if we're doing it a bit more ad hoc and also if it's disconnected between blogs and other places and then none of them are really connected to the exact commit that created the issue it might be more difficult to figure out what's what okay well i'll just take an action then to um to explore that that link um in terms of the GitHub and the change log, and Chris, we, we've got some uh, refinements to the process there. I think the only thing I'm, the only thing in the back of my mind is that we we will move into a fast track process, and I don't want to undermine that by creating, uh, you know, excessive avenues for discussion. But let's uh, let's you know let's uh, let's give it a go. I agree with that, Howard. I think I think it, there's probably something about making sure that the there's not an expected. We're not waiting for community to necessarily comment on everything. It's more yeah. that it's there in case people are interested in following it. Because I, I totally agree. We don't want to be in another situation where we create bureaucracy for the sake of it. It's more about transparency than bureaucracy. Possible. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks, Howard. And uh, thanks, Chris, for taking us through the activity list. There's some interesting things on that, that list of additions, aren't there? I'm not sure what Bell then Cress is. Uh, so I'm going to go and look up the definition for that afterwards and see what that actually is. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. interesting. OK, cool. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> what? Uh, hang on. Let's go back one. So what I wanted to do for the remainder of the meeting, uh, leaving a bit of time for AB, of course, is to talk about the future a bit um, uh, and the, the, the future of, of Open Active, uh, the specifications, uh, the tech stack and, and, and how we kind of prioritise things that we want this group to focus on moving forwards. Um, so obviously still being relatively new to open active i've had lots of enjoyable time reading governance documents and trying to work out what open active is and how it works um and i just thought it'd be useful to dig into some of those a little bit to think about what the group is here to do um so we have a few documents that kind of seem to describe what this group is for um the most recent one is a governance and processes document from 2018 um uh, and, and that describes our goal as being development of openly licensed standards, technical recommendations and best practices, uh, being a location for people to collaborate with one another um, uh, and to work on um, a few areas of standardization. So, so the first one being around uh, opportunities, the second one about uh, booking APIs uh, and the third one about kind of standardizing data to improve interoperability. Um, We've also got a charter, which I think is a requirement of being part of the W3C. Uh, the charter broadly expresses the same things, but uses slightly different language um, to, to, to the governance and processing document, but, but broadly has the same focuses. Um, and then uh, on the Open Active W3 webpage, um, th there's also a, a kind of set of objectives for the group. So, so one is about uh, publishing uh, uh, and enabling systems and websites to make activity data easily found. There's a, a bit about activities, so this is about labeling, and there's a bit about kind of content types. And I think out of all of the descriptions I looked at, this one was the kind of the vaguest one and probably needs a bit of an update. Um, but I think what I've taken from those and what I've been kind of been thinking about a little bit is about what this group needs to be thinking about. And I, and I think in terms of thinking about what we're doing in the future, I can kind of see two key areas of focus. So the first one is a kind of continuous improvement space. So actually, this is about um, resolving issues, solving problems as they arise, making sure that the infrastructure keeps working, making sure where there are problems uh, or issues, we we quickly find ways to fix those and, and keep the thing working. Um, I think the second area of continuous improvement is around technical use cases. So actually, we have ideas, don't we, about how we want this thing to be and how we want it to work and how we want it to develop. And and actually, this this group has an important role in in discussing those ideas, testing those ideas, uh, and prioritizing those ideas. And and I think we had some discussion last time around um, the mapping of facilities to activities. And I, I kind of see that as a really good tactical. Uh, discussion uh, uh, and a potentially potentially technical use case. All that stuff's quite reactive. It's all quite responsive. It's all quite immediate. Um, and I think one of the other the, the other thing that this group needs to do is have a much longer term focus. So actually starting to think about how the open active infrastructure will develop over the long term, uh, over the two, three, five years sort of time scale. So we understand and we can have some certainty about what we want the data architecture, the data specifications, the technical architecture to look like in, in three to five years time. So that as we invest our time and effort in, in Open Active, we are all investing in the same direction. And, and I think that's really important because we've got quite a limited resource. So, so I think in terms of thinking about what we want to talk about in the future, I think we need to think, spend some time thinking about continuous improvement matters. And I think we need to spend some time thinking about strategic road mapping matters. Before I got here, this group came up with a list of future topics um, for, for discussion. Um, and this is the list that I was given by Howard, who's disappeared. I don't know if he's feeling guilty or something. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so, so we, we've got kind of future topics. There's something around accessibility um, and, and providing accessibility information in the feeds. Um, there's something about how we manage the activity list and facility list. Uh, there's a whole stack of GitHub issues. Uh, the example that was given was high frequency ad hoc sessions. I think we've got a bit of an issue with GitHub. I think we've got a bit of a backlog. I think there's quite a lot of stuff in there that we need to deal with and need to think about. Um, there's the kind of interaction between open active and open referral that's becoming a hotter topic by the minute. Um, uh, 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 I'll come back to that maybe if we've got time at the end. Uh, We've got the root specification. I think uptake of that's been reasonably low. Is that something we want to prioritise uh, or not? Um, we've talked about court clubs and courses. Uh, we've talked about processes. Uh, and then the last area was kind of safeguarding. So actually, how do you exchange data to understand whether a provider has got the relevant safeguarding uh, provisions, qualifications, et cetera? And I suspect there are loads of other things that you guys would like to talk about that are in your brains that we haven't captured and that this is just the top level list um so what i thought it would be useful to do was try and map some of these things by the category they fall into whether they're kind of continuous improvement or whether they're they're long-term strategic things uh and about how uh, around how urgent they are as well so i before i will put this link into the meeting but before i do let me try and show you how i'm visualizing that at the moment so hopefully you can still see my screen basically what i've, I've done is i've created a really simple board um on the one side i've kind of got the, the tactical stuff the issues and the problems and the technical use cases and on the other side i've got the more strategic stuff the data architecture specifications technical architecture uh, and what I've tried to do is take those things off that previous slide and put them onto the Jamboard and put them where I think they fit. So the top of the board is stuff that's urgent that we've got to crack on with and the bottom of the board is stuff that's not urgent and we we can, uh, and we don't need to prioritize so, so quite so much. Um, the propose, what, I'm, what I'm proposing that we do is I'll, I'll share the link to this Jamboard with everyone through the chat. Um, and then I, I think what we can do is have a quick discussion about the things that are already on the board. Um, and maybe just spend two minutes on each one and work out whether it, I've put it in the right place or whether I've misunderstood. I'm really happy to be wrong. I don't care that much about being wrong. Um, I'd like to rather get it right and get your insight uh, and then add anything that's missing to the board. Um, in parallel to this, the steering committee are increasingly starting to think about the kind of strategic direction for Open Active. And what I've been asked that they're having a discussion tomorrow at their steering committee meeting about the kind of strategic objectives for open active. And what I would like to do is bring this strategic view of the tech and data infrastructure together with the strategic view that the steering committee are talking about what the initiatives should be and seeing if they align and if they don't align, working out why. So, so I, I think this exercise is quite timely. So that's kind of where we are. Um, while I share the board, does anyone have any questions? Is the infrastructure stuff, issues with infrastructure, of which you may be aware of some of them already, is that in issues and problems or is it in strategic architecture? Uh, if it's an issue that needs resolving in the short term, because it's affecting the operations of the infrastructure, it's an issue or a problem. If it's something that we would like to do or that we think is desirable to do for the future, it's probably in the strategic box. So there's things we need to fix, are probably issues and problems, things we want to test our use cases and things that we think we might want to do in the future are the strategic things. Does that make sense? Um, sorry, I'm just having problems finding the chat. So the link to the board's in the chat. It's a public board, so you should all be able to get into it. Um, I don't think it is people to sign in for these. Yeah, I mean, oh. um, I'm just going to open it in a different browser window that isn't shared. So, um, 
the first couple of things, I'm going to start with the issues and problems column. So the first couple of things, I guess the first question is, are, are all those things, things that people think are think of things that need resolving? A couple of them are a bit generic, like the GitHub and the, the, the kind of processes and guidance. But I, I've checked management activity list and the facilities list in there because we're kind of working on those at the moment. So I presume at some point, because we're working on them, someone's decided they're, they're urgent things that we need to deal with. Um, so that, I've put those at the top. Uh, I think the GitHub issues we need to kind of explode that out a bit. So if there are any, if anyone's got any favourite GitHub issues, we could probably add those. Um, and then in terms of the high frequency ad hoc sessions, I wasn't entirely sure what that was. Um, it was listed as an example of a GitHub issue. I don't know how. I, I guess adding some description and what what that is would be helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I guess people's first thoughts on those that box would be good. Are we expected to edit this or is it because I think we've got view only uh, I, I, access. So we're telling, are we telling you to update things? I think, it's, yeah, tell me to update things. I, I, I think it's easier to see in the share than it, it, by going into it than through the screen share. So yeah, just um, if you want to make changes, tell me, but let's, let's. Um, okay. I'll jump in. Management and activity list. I think, I feel like we're close to, you know, that that's, we've been working on that for the first few months of this year. We've got a new process. We've got. Uh, you know, we think it's working. So I'd, that certainly, if there isn't a done column, it goes down to to not urgent. Although promotion of the activity list beyond the open activity uh, initiative, or as using it as a tool to draw other organisations and initiatives, make them aware of open active, is more of a strategic thing. Yeah. So I think. What drove working on the activity list um, was that it, it has potential for standardization across the sector, and that's a strategic data architecture kind of yeah. challenge. Um, what um, you know, while we were there, with the, we looked at the facilities types list, and we realised that that could probably benefit from a similar process. It changes less, I think, um, but. You know, so so that's that is probably still medium urgency. Uh, you know, we, we get by with the spreadsheet that we've got. Um, yeah, do uh, do we want to well on high frequency ad hoc sessions? So, uh, for just a one line summary, um, Andrew, I would say that the particularly. With COVID, the way that uh, you could book a gym session changed. You, you know, you could just turn up to a gym, uh, but then there were limits on the number of people, and you needed a time slot. So that the shape of the data, the shape of the opportunity data, changed over that time. And uh, different publishers have, have managed that in different ways. So it's kind of created a, a challenge um, for the activity finder people um, to take that changing shape of the data where it's changing different shapes and to kind of present that in a way that makes it a decent user experience that's the challenge in in my words do we have any activity finder people who have views on that Totally following the issue. Sorry. Sorry, you broke up, Nick. I'm not entirely following the issue. Sorry. So, so this right. was what well, that was my explanation of the high frequency ad hoc sessions situation. Um, Nick, was sorry. Was I... This is uh, I'm no, no, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, makes sense. And the view, the question from Andrew is do we have a view on the importance of resolving this? Yeah. Is that the question? So I think I think probably because we've only got eleven minutes to do this. Maybe the higher level response to that is um, every GitHub issue has got different stakeholders that need it to a different extent, um, and some of those become urgent. To your point on reactive bubble up, at which point we like need to move on this. The ones that are currently not being discussed, as no one's emailed you yesterday about them, probably not urgent right now. So we could we could say that many of these things have kind of settled back into the, the state of there's an, there's something that works for now. People have kind of found a workaround. It's not urgent, and therefore we need to solve it, but not immediately. 
And so I'd say there's a huge number of issues where that's the case. And at any given moment, they could become urgent again because someone's trying to implement or use or something, at which point we need to then schedule a call and da 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 da. Um, so my suggestion would be given the expertise that we've got present currently um, in this phase around the different aspects of the, of the issues raised, it's probably worth investing time in that longer term, you know, pulling all the context into those issues, making sure we have the robust discussions where needed. Um, my concern would be if we leave that backlog just sitting there for another two, three years, that there will everyone who will have left the building who has any idea what that stuff was and will be left with forever a reactive situation because it will only be when the reactive stuff comes in that people then will gather and deal with. And so I think we've got a unique opportunity really until the end of the phase to solve this a kind of backlog issue, really put things in, in good places and park things with all of the input that we need. Um, and I would suggest that's quite important. So that's a neat kind of segue into one of the kind of burning questions that I've got. And, and, and I wonder if we need to use one or more of these sessions to go through that backlog of issues, issue by issue, and have a discussion in the round about it. Um, I think that could take quite a lot of time, um, but I think it could be quite valuable. Yeah, my suggestion would be um, as a first step, and this is this is part of the knowledge transfer work that Andrew we're in discussion about at the moment. Um, that the the person that's raised the issue, which many times is myself, on the basis of those that have spoken to me about it, I think that probably accounts for ninety percent. I've got context of those issues spends the time triaging and elaborating the issue on the basis of the knowledge that is already available so rather than spending i don't think we'd actually get through them all on this in this format in this forum because there's just too many of them um but that information is is put in there and then we can actually stack rank them um maybe somewhere like this you could imagine putting them together and people saying i've got some urgency around this but also as part of that knowledge transfer uh, actually flagging those ones what the dependencies are you know what is it who which organizations does this particular one relate to when is it likely to become urgent etc cetera, etc cetera. um i think that's the way that yeah, with many of these things uh, i think that's the way that, that um to go okay that's interesting thank you um so yeah and then and then i think uh the kind of last block in this box were about things like um, improving processes, improving guidance. And I, I, I kind of left them in here because they're kind of things that, that kind of are quite short term, but without knowing what guidance and what processes, that they felt quite vague. Um, and, and I think I was, I think what occurred to me was we need more insights about, about what processes and guidance we're going to kind of, kind of look at first. Um, in terms of, so, so moving across the table, in terms of the technical use cases, um, the the obvious one at the moment is around the interaction between open active and open referral. And uh, there are a number of people who are interested in this within open active and within open referral. Um, uh, and I, I think there's probably a piece of work to do as a priority to look at the, re the relationship between the two and how data from open active becomes open referral compliant and is made accessible through that that open referral infrastructure um sorry, um, sorry andrew i might be a little bit lost in this maybe it's a new term but what 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 is the definition of open referral, what yeah, is okay. open, referral? So open referral is very similar to open active it is a schema.org based uh scores uh, uh jason ld framework for sharing data um, and, and open refer is focus on data about community services. Um, so there is a legal requirement on local authorities to provide a directory of community services in a couple of categories. Um, one is um, childcare uh, and I think the other one is around safeguarding services uh, or, 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 or social work services. I, I can't quite remember what the definition is. Uh, and open referral basically provides a data standard sharing that information. They have a lot of the same challenges that we have. Um, uh, uh, open referral in many ways is a simpler standard than open active so it's about taking an ab get, taking an abstract of the data out of open active and putting it into an open referral standard and the benefit of doing that is that anyone who's built a social prescribing system that uses open referral will then be able to get access to the data that's in the open active feeds um, 
so there are some discussions going on at the moment between ODI and open referral. Um, we know that there are people in uh, various uh, organisations who are interested in making this work and um, uh, Tim and I are going to work with them to kind of create a technical use case around this um, and potentially attract some funding as well to, to look into this in a bit more detail. Um, but I think that's, that's quite an interesting... You, got, you guys are aware that there's already a mapping that, that they've done on that? You must, you must be. Okay, great. Just checking. Yeah, no, we're aware of the, the mapping that exists already. Um, I, I think it's a question of how to operationalize it. I think there are a couple of options. One option is that you have a sort of central transformation service, um, which takes open active data and transforms it to, to open referral. Uh, I guess the other alternative is that you, you do it at source. So you provide a pattern that a data publisher can use. So essentially, you could, I, 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 guess, you might, I guess you could end up with a data set, uh, data set site with a, an open active tab an open bookings tab and an open referral tab. Um, so we just need to work out what the best way of doing that is. It's like a great discussion for another one of these forums. It does, absolutely. It's not a discussion for, for four minutes left. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll keep people posted on that as it develops. Um, so there's a kind of, that's a good, it's a good example though of a technical use case, right? There are, and there must be many other technical use cases that we've got. Um, and then uh, moving on to the sort of more strategic stuff, I, I, I think um, we, we've talked a bit about clubs in the past. Uh, that feels like a, a fairly urgent thing that we want to deal with. Uh, we want we want to have an approach to dealing with information about clubs, safeguarding accessibility. That safeguarding particularly keeps cropping up in conversations I'm having with people across the network. This idea of how do I trust your provider over my own internal provider is a really interesting question. Um, the, the link to active places and how we deal with that. A couple of people have mentioned that uh, and, uh, in the last couple of meetings. Um, and I think there's some stuff that's less urgent. I think I get I get a sense that Roots is less urgent, um, that the specification exists, but I don't get a great sense that there's an appetite, a great sense of an appetite to, to kind of really push the Roots specification. Um, uh, and courses has cropped up a couple of times. Um, and I'm guessing that is a, a, a learn to swim course or a, a, a football training course or a tennis coaching course, that sort of course. Um, so, so those are the things that I've kind of got in the strategic box. Um, I guess my question would be, is there anything that isn't on this list that should be? Uh, an immediate thoughts on that. I mean, I'd say in the um, the spec box, uh, we've got add-ons, um, which has an open issue on at the moment. I'd put that very much on the non-urgent side. Yep. We've also got, and this is a this is a hangover from I think last phase, or maybe even the phase before. I'm not sure. Lost track of phases. Um, the um, the issue with the yeah, specifications and finalizing those, yeah. we've basically got a, 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 the current specs that are in use are a blend of um, outstanding issues that have been resolved to, to a satisfactory status and codified documentation and the specs themselves across, I think, all specifications. So we, we do have a situation where the, the current, current state of, of, of the spec is not clear. Um, and that's just because we haven't had the resources to actually update the specs. Um, and so I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, I mean, a, 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 an objective of last phase, I think, or we maybe even a phase before that we, we haven't met, but certainly something that could be done this phase yeah. um, is, is updating those. I mean, is that strategic or is that that's an issue or problem that we need to resolve? I, I think, I don't know. It, it's a well, so the, the, for me, that's... It was like it's strategic in that every, everything's it's not on fire right now because everyone just ignores the spec and uses the documentation um and so we have a workaround um as with many things that you're not hearing daily about we've got ways around these these issues um but uh, it, there's there's i guess there's if we were doing open active property in the commas things would be like a certain way <laughs> but there's things that we're just kind of figuring out without that okay I'll jump in. We haven't got long left. Um, I think I've put a comment in the chat. Um, 
active places and that accessibility could be linked as a technical use case. Um, and it kind of might prove or disprove whether it, it's a, it is a strategic route we want to go. Okay. And this is like bringing uh, in real time, perhaps bringing the accessibility information from active places where it exists when you've got uh, a you know, an incoming open active location. Um, the other thing I would mention when we talk about safeguarding, we're talking about uh, individuals and kind of providers, activity providers, trainers, whatever it might be. So there's kind of that identity. Uh, we talked about this morning with Australia, digital identity, um, where we move into talking about information about individual um, providers. Uh, so, you know, and uh, this has come up in other conversations. What level of training have they got? Um, you know, do they have what first aid provision? All those kind of things that are kind of questions that come up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we're losing people, so I'm going to suggest we stop there and I will post the link to an editable version of this into the Slack um, and ask for people's thoughts and comments offline. But I've enjoyed that meeting. It's good to see data quality stuff progressing and it's uh, it's good to see the, the activity list improving. And I think there are some interesting ideas about what we do next. So thank you. Um, I'll see you all soon.